So when you were in medical school, um, what drew you to radiology? Or at, at the time, did you go into radiology first and then radiation oncology? Or how did you, um, how did you make that um, choice? You, you know, I like, the, the radiology was a minimum game puzzle. You know, you, you, you're a minimum inf information puzzle where you, you, you know, sort of get bits and pieces of things and try to put it together. And, and I, I really like that as an intellectual exercise. I, I know, somehow it appealed to me. Um, and uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I, you know, I was a very shy uh, kind of retiring kid. Dealing with patients was very difficult for me. Um, it was a lot easier to work, <laughs> to work with films. Um, and so it, it just, it, it intellectually and psychologically met the kinds of things that I, I like to do. So um, it, just, it just felt like the right thing. And, uh, and I'm happy I did it because that, that was really one of the few things in medical school that I liked. So. Which I think is very common for people with our background. I, I had decided early on that I was going to go into surgery. Um, and, and one of the drawbacks, I guess, of deciding early on what you're going to do is it makes some of the other rotations you go through less enjoyable. Um, but that wasn't true for radiology because once I got to my month of radiology, I was, I mean, categorically obsessed with this field because first of all, all of the residents I met were basically engineers, mathematicians, and physicists. So it heavily selects for those people an understanding of math and physics gave you an understanding of how the MRI machine worked in a way that you, you simply couldn't understand that without the background. And I remember thinking, God, I wish there was a way to do both surgery and radiology. <laughs> yeah. So it, yeah, it was, I found it very appealing and, uh, and, and enjoyed the residency and did enjoy people that I, I began working with in that, in that setting. So where was it in your, um, radiology career, if not sooner, that you began to um, start to think about cancer in a different way? Well, my first job outside of training was at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And um, I hadn't really thought about cancer very much. And of course, we, you know, we, we kind of had these very dogmatic views of cancer and what training I did get. And, uh, but when you work in a cancer center, I mean, it, it, you, you just want to help. I mean, I mean, it just, it felt like you want to make a contribution because this disease is just so awful. And so, um, so I decided I would, I would spend more time learning about cancer and I would, uh, you know, really just get textbooks and read it. And uh, um, one of the things I started reading was the, the, the journal Cancer Research, which is the flagship journal of the AACR. And one of the things I found was that I would read an article and say, boy, this is really a good article and that's really interesting and important. And then I would read another article and have the same response, but then I would try to think of, well, how do these fit together? How do these relate to one another? And, and I couldn't see that. And, and there, there was no organizing principles that was involved. I mean, they, they, the authors themselves were not trying to, to put these together. They were simply making a sequence of observations. Each were really quite separate. And and, and, and as you know, um, in the physics world, these things had happened. The planetary motions, for example, um, you know, Tycho Brahe and others pretty much had the data, but the data was overwhelming and complicated. Um, you know, Kepler developed a kind of geometric um, I interaction, and then ultimately it was Newton who developed first principles that could put all this together. And, you know, similar with the Balmer lines uh, in the uh, early 20th century, the particle zoo in the, in the mid 20th century, all of those required um, theoretical mastery of it. You know, you, you, you could even to... make the case with, with Einstein's work around um, the photoelectric effect. I mean, most people think Einstein won the Nobel Prize for relativity, but it was actually for the photoelectric effect. Uh, photoelectric yeah. effect. And he was not the first person to make the observation. He was simply the first person to put it all together. And, yeah. and I've always found that to be a very illustrative case of what really, what genius really is. It's that ability to assimilate information um, and pattern from what others can't see. And that, you know, that Einstein and others are the examples. So, so I decided that maybe where I could contribute is to focus on 
developing first principles, developing a, uh, a, a kind of framework of understanding, but recognizing that it really had to be mathematical. And so I, um, I actually spent about a year relearning the mathematics. Um, I'd forgotten it all by then. And um, then uh, worked on developing, you know, so what are the first principles? And I, I decided that it would, you know, it'd have to be evolution in ecology, that, that all living systems essentially obey the laws of Darwin and, and therefore cancer must do the same. And so I sat down and I started writing um, uh, population uh, dynamic equations looking at, uh, at cancer, looking at the interaction of cancer with, with normal cells and then the cancers with each other, cancer cells with each other and competing them and, and, and that sort of thing. And so that was um, how I, I started it. Um, now, why, why were you so convinced, Bob, that this had to be done mathematically as opposed to theoretically, but without the, the, the quote unquote cumbersome mathematics that comes with it? I think that, that um, I brought with it an appreciation of nonlinearity, um, that human beings think linearly. And when complex systems have nonlinear things like feedback loops, that uh, you know, so the linear thinking is if you do one, you get two, you get two, you do two, you get four, you get four, you do eight. You know, that we're real good. The human brain is very good at that. But nonlinear dynamics, we're, we're really not good at all. And, and there, a, a great example, which is also from Philadelphia, uh, was uh, Benjamin Franklin wanted to see the, uh, a lunar eclipse one evening. And, um, but a nor'easter. Came in now. A nor'easter. If you live in Philadelphia, you're, you're familiar with these. They winds coming from the northeast, northeast, hence the name. And this, uh, you know, these are often violent storms. And so it rolled in, and he couldn't see the, the 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 lunar eclipse. Now Franklin, like all scientists of his day, thought that the wind carried the storm. In effect, if you ask a child, how do you what how do you think storms move? They will say, well, it must be the wind blowing it, because it, it makes sense. It, it's intuitively obvious that that's the case. <clears throat> but when he, learned, when he talked to his brother in Boston about the eclipse, it turned out that the storm arrived in Boston after the eclipse was over. So in fact, the storm was going in the opposite direction of the wind. And he was really the first uh, scientist to, be, to, to recognize that that's, that, that, that that obvious, that, that, that something that's intuitively clear must be happening is also wrong. And, and so I think that um, in cancers, we see nonlinearities all the time. And, and again, the feedback, the evolutionary dynamics of, of resistance, for example, is a good example of that. And we can't intuitively predict those things. We, we need to actually understand first principles and the underlying mathematics to, to, to capture that piece of it. And so, I guess I was very involved in that kind of thing. And it, to me, it seemed obvious that we needed to do the math because um, what, what the things that were, were being done in, in cancer treatment were often intuitively obvious, but were clearly not working. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, mean, I may be putting retrospective you know, analysis on that, but at the time, it seemed that it really had to be understood mathematically. And of course, from a physics background, that's just kind of a natural, you know, the theory has to be fundamentally about mathematics. So just, this is just sort of a fun aside question. Why do you think that evolution um, gave us as humans the ability to understand linear systems quite well and absolutely no capability to understand nonlinear systems? So for example, um, <clears throat> it's clear that we don't understand hyperbolic discounting. Like we, we just can't do it. Is it simply that evolution wasn't optimizing for that problem? Yeah. And it really didn't, when it came down to reproduction and survival, linearity was sufficient? That would be my guess, that, that what we need to know to survive and, and, and proliferate is, is, linear, is sufficiently linear that we can probably, that's probably all that was needed. Uh, but I... I you know, I'd, I'd have to think more about that. I mean, what's, what's linear in the world that um, is so important? But, but my sense is that um, relatively simple things that, that are related to, you know, eating and running away from uh, predators and that sort of thing and run, running after mates are probably sufficiently linear that that was really the, all that was necessary. So as you're getting deeper into the mathematics 
of um, of 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 of, um, of the biology, you're probably struck by the fact that you don't have a lot of colleagues in this space, right? There's not a conference for theoretical <laughs> no, biologists, no. right? No, no, and and to, and similar to the the response of your colleagues to your model, um, pretty much everybody, pretty much all of my colleagues hated it. Um, thought the whole thing was ridiculous. But did they, were they even qualified to understand it? No, probably not, but but just on an intuitive level, it was, um, they just couldn't understand why you would do this. And, and it's funny because if, if I had a dollar for every time someone said to me that cancer is too complicated to model, I, I, you know, I wouldn't have to apply for grants anymore because that was kind of the prevailing wisdom. And, and I mean, the irony of that is that the argument itself is self is self defeating. If it's that complicated, then you have to have mathematics. I mean, you, you there's there's no way that the that the human brain is going to understand complex systems without sufficient you know mathematics. I, unfortunately, I think in there was a certain arrogance that you're also taught as physicians, which is that well, it's too complicated to model, but my superior intellect will be able to sort of master this. And and figure it out. I mean, I, I always got the feeling that there was that that second clause in that statement that that was that went unsaid, but was part of this kind of idea that this confidence that um, we can understand this and and you know we step back and, and we can take care of this without the mathematics. Um, and so so I think it takes some humility to say, well, I, I really need to look at the math models and, and the computer simulations to understand how I think this is going to happen. I don't know that we physicians have been taught humility with, with <laughs> sufficiently well to, um, you know, to accept that. Yeah. And, and, and another great example of that is look at other incredibly complex systems like um, economics. Um, and of course, I, I don't know what the stats would be, but certainly a sufficient number of the Nobel prizes awarded in that field are, you know, in their fun are fundamentally based on mathematics, right? Whether it be sure, game theory absolutely. or otherwise, uh, obviously a lot of them are behavioral as well, but nevertheless, I don't think anybody is suggesting that the models are sufficient in economics. <clears throat> in other words, that you can take an economic model, you can plug in all of the initial conditions and it will tell you the answer. If unemployment is this, if the rate of home price appreciation is this, if inflation is this, here are 50, you know, starting variables, put them in the model and it will spit out, you know, GDP growth 10 years from now. I don't think anybody's so delusional to believe that that's true, but it still doesn't minimize what the model can do for your understanding of the system. Yeah, we, we like to talk about uh, hurricane modeling. Um, you know, and, and weather modeling in general, which is which is a, a classic example of how to master a complex dynamic system, um, and you know, you can you can pretty much you can be pretty sure that you can predict what's going to happen in the next twenty four hours. After that, the the, um, the the complexity as well as stochastic uh, p, you know changes are going to degrade the the accuracy, but th that doesn't mean that. So at each day, you you, you you get more data, and you just keep predicting forward. Um, it's it's not necessary, at least again in, in in sort of cancer modeling, to say what's going to happen ten years from now. It's an, it's just you need to know what should I do, to, what therapy should I use today, and and for the next three months, say, and then after that, we'll we'll get more data. We'll 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 start again. Um, but but sometimes people expect more of that of it than that, and like you said, that's uh, this idea that we should be able to predict the entire course is 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 not realistic. You know, I'm glad you brought up hurricanes and and weather because, as you note, they're some of the most complicated models out there, mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with the fact that they behave in many ways as these you know like Lorenz curves, right? So they are chaotic systems, yeah. and yeah. because they are so 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 sensitive to initial conditions. Um, they don't really behave well outside of very, very narrow delta T windows. And, you know, as we, I remember still, I remember in college when we began studying chaos, you know, the first example you learn is about the butterfly that flaps its wings in Tokyo that leads to the yeah. storm two weeks later yeah. in New York. 
where would you put, and this is getting way ahead of ourselves because we're going to come back and go through it from an evolution perspective, but just at the outset, before I forget to ask this question, where would you put cancer models on the relative spectrum of here's a really well-behaved model on one side, you know, some linear regression model that works perfectly because you have infinite past data and the future scenarios don't deviate. So that's like a monkey model. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have the weather predicting, hurricane predicting model as the most chaotic. If, if that's a one and a 10, where does, where does cancer biology behave? I think probably eight or nine. Okay. I mean, I think it's I think it's on more on the chaotic. I think there's a lot of stochasticity. There's also a lot of heterogeneity, um, and I think those things make it difficult. Um, and um, so it, it's it's harder to predict, but not infinitely hard. I mean, I, I think we can we can do this, but we always have to have a level of humility and understanding that. Um, First of all, evolution is very clever uh, and likes to in, uh, embarrass you, <laughs> so that um, I, you know it, it can easy, you can easily crash and burn. Uh, um, but it's not it's not random either. I mean, there, there's there's predictability to it, and and finding that 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 point between them where you can predict with reasonable certainty uh, and also sort of hedge your bets in ways that even if things don't go exactly as you plan, you can still benefit the patient from uh, you know, early recognition that it's not going the way you planned, recalibrating models, rethinking the underlying dynamics, and then going forward, um, as opposed to, you know, here's your, your model, you know, just <laughs> take one a day uh, for the next 10 years and you'll be fine. Uh, I, I don't think we can, we can be at that point. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.